warmest greetings in the Lord, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, who also happen to be Grace Institute of Biblical Studies students. So glad that you could join me today as we continue our Pondering the Page time with this present series on abiding in Christ as it's found in John 15. So I encourage you to and invite you to open your Bibles with me to this amazing passage of the Word of God. Now, in this third lesson in this series, we want to look at your two choices in abiding. They're actually found in verses 6 and 7, if you'd like to drop down with me, where it says, If anyone does not abide in me, is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this... My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. There are many passages in the Word of God where we see there are two options. We see there are two choices. And keep in mind that the best decisions in life are always by faith decisions, in which we take God at his word, where we respond to what he says, where we trust him, and as a result, he then pulls it off in our life. Now, I'm reminded of those two options when I think of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said here in the Sermon on the Mount, Enter you and at the straight gate wide. Option number one, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Option number two, because straight is the gate and narrows the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. The Bible is filled with contrasts. Contrasts have a way of clarifying for us many truths. Notice he says, on the one hand, wide is the gate, opposite is straight is the gate. Here is broad is the way, here is narrow is the way. One leads to destruction, the other leads to life. One, there's many, and they're here there's few. As a result, choose option number two. And the moment you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God who became a man, who went to the cross and died for your sins, and paid for them completely, was buried as proof of his death, and rose from the dead, as according to the scriptures, evidenced by being seen by over 500 people. The moment you put your faith in Christ alone, you enter through the straight gate. You are now on the narrow way. It leads to life. You are among the few that find it. Because the majority of the world today is lost in need of a Savior. They are trying to earn their way to salvation, nirvana, eternal life, the afterlife through their own efforts and works, and they have not placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why in John 3, verse 18, we see again two options when it comes to our eternal destiny. Option number one, <coughs> excuse me, students. Option number one, he who believes in him, Jesus Christ, is not condemned. Option number two, but, the contrasting conjunction, he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Again, we see the contrast between those who believe and those who do not believe. Those who are not condemned, they are saved, and those who are condemned. And the difference is, what do they think and believe about Jesus Christ? But again, God does not allow us to stay in the middle. If option one is not true of you, then option two is automatically true of you, or vice versa. Now, this, this is not only true of our eternal destiny and our relationship with Christ, but it's also true even as a believer. This was emphasized in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. In Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 9, he says, Thus saith the Lord. Option number one, curses the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, his source 
of strength. He does it through his own viewpoint, and he does it through his own manpower. And as a result, his, his heart departs from the Lord, because we don't depend upon the Lord to do it. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and he shall not see when good comes. Even when good comes and God is still gracious, he doesn't even see it from the hand of the Lord. But shall inherit, inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Option number two is blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. These are polar opposites. They're diametrically opposed. In one case, one is cursed, the other is blessed. One who trusts in man, the other who trusts in the Lord. One whose flesh is, who makes flesh his strength, the other who hopes in the Lord. One is like a, a tree, a shrub in the desert. The other is like a tree planted by the waters. One isn't fruitful, the other is. The question is, which one are you? And which one am I? And this is going to directly connect with what we see in John 15. But keep in mind, we're ever prone to self-deception. We're ever prone to think we can do it. And as a result, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we think of these opposites and contrasts. The Lord Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, says, therefore, option number one, Whoever hears these saying of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, on this solid foundation. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And that's how your life will be, he's saying to the crowd. If you hear these sayings of mine and you do them, you apply them in your life. Option number two is separated by the word but once again. But. Everyone who hears the saying of mine and does not do them. Notice, they both hear, but one does and the other doesn't apply. We'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So again, he's challenging his hearers to take to heart and apply what he's been teaching with great consequences that follow either way. It'll be one or the other. Now, he says a similar thing in Mark chapter 8 where he's challenging his disciples. And he says, whoever desires to save his life, you try to hang on to your life, preserve your life, it's all about you, you play tight to the vest, you live the comfortable life, you're going to end up losing it. Not in the sense of losing your salvation, but losing what your whole purpose and meaning and fruitfulness really could be. You'll live a wasted life, is the idea. But, option number two, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will actually save it. You see, when you're willing to go outside your comfort zone, when you're willing to say, I want to walk by faith, I want to do the will of God through the power of the Spirit of God, for the glory of God and for the gospel's sake, you know what? You find that you live life to the full. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world by saving his life, but he loses his own soul, and the word soul, psyche here, carries the idea of his life. What life is all about is life's purpose and what could have been a true in his life. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And so the idea there is life. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, there are some believers who misunderstand this in lordship salvation and teach that this is a salvation from sin's penalty passage. And yet, as we look at the parallel passage in Matthew 16, it is very clear that whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but option two, whoever loses life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange 
for his soul. So the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. It's a passage to believers. This is a passage about living a life that honors the Lord, that's worthwhile versus worthless, and in the end, you get rewarded from the Lord himself accordingly. This isn't talking about how to be saved from hell at all. A similar passage is found in Romans 8. For what the law could not do, verse 3, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned the sin, nature, in the flesh, that, what does God want to do in our life? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled, not by us, but in us. Option one, who do not walk according to the flesh, but option two, who do walk according to the spirit. Could you clarify a little more? Yes. For those who, option one, live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. The word according to is the Greek word kata, and it means uh, according to the norms and standards of the flesh. In other words, you operate under human viewpoint, and thus you rely on the strength of man, just like John or Jeremiah 17.5 says. You set your mind on the things of the flesh, but option two, those who live according to the Spirit, according to the norms and standards of the Spirit of God as they're found in the Word of God, and as you walk by faith in reliance on the Spirit of God, and they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. They're occupied with Jesus Christ and the Word of God, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. They're walking by faith. They're enjoying fellowship with the Lord. And the Spirit of God is producing divine good in their life that's worthy of God's glory and will ultimately be rewarded. Now, here in John 15, and I lay all that groundwork to get here, again, we see the two contrasts. You see, verses 6 and 7 have nothing to do about losing one's salvation. He's giving us the fact that having emphasized the necessity of abiding in Christ, now we have two options. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. But option number two is if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So which option will be true in your life? Now, we can, I know we can go back and forth on this. Option one once in a while, then option two once in a while, or maybe longer or less. But we're looking at an overall pattern in your life. And that's why you must learn to live the Christian life step by step, day by day which then turns into weeks and then to months and to years and into a lifetime. We've seen already in John 15 that the emphasis of this first section is on abiding in Christ. This next section is loving other believers. And the last section is being a witness to a world that hates Christ and you. We've already noted that we need to remember the three persons of the vineyard. Jesus Christ is the true vine, the Father is the vine dresser, and branches are believers. We noted that we need to recognize the position of the branches. They're in Christ. The exact place they need to be to be fruitful. Thirdly, we need to realize the purpose of the branches is to bear fruit for Jesus Christ. Not for fuel, not for decoration, not for looks, but to be fruitful. We need to, fourthly, reckon upon the purposeful activity of the vine dresser. If he sees you're unfruitful, he first of all wants to lift you up. If you're fruitful, he then prunes you that you may bear more fruit. A fifth thing we notice is we need to review, or we could say we don't need to repeat the prerequisite for the branches to bear fruit, namely their sins are washed away. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. You don't need another bath. You don't need to be saved from sin's penalty. 
You don't need to be regenerated. That's already true. So what is it we need, Lord? Well, we need to rest in the primary necessity for the branches to bear fruit. They must abide in Christ by faith. And that's what verses 4 and 5 again emphasize. Abide where? In me, he says. To remain, to stay, or to rest in dependence on Christ as your resource for fruit. Remain in fellowship with me, and I will remain in fellowship with you. This is an aorist active imperative again. Choose to make abiding in Christ your top priority. It's necessary if you're going to be fruitful. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. For without me, you can do nothing. Well, these verses, I think, are very clear. And by this time, you've heard them several times. You should know them very well. Now, the question is, what are you going to do with them? The question is, what are you going to do with them today? And then tomorrow and the next day. You say, well, Pastor Dennis or Dr. Roxer, what are my options? Well, the Lord Jesus lays out, what are your two options? As you have two choices and they have consequences. There are two places you can abide or not abide, as set forth in verses 6 through 8. Option number one, verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me. Now the word if is in the third class condition in the Greek, which means you might or you might not. Now at this point, you have not been established in Greek unless you've done this on your own. And there are four class conditions, and it should be on your handout there. The first class is if, and it's assumed to be true from the standpoint of the speaker or writer. Why? Because either it is true, or at least for the sake of argument. Second class is if, and it's assumed not to be true from the standpoint of the speaker or writer, either because it's not true or for the sake of argument. Third class is if and it may or may not be true. Now, some have said this is the mood of probability. I don't think that's the case. I think it's better understood to, this is the mood of possibility because if it's probability, we have a problem right here. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, and that probably won't be the case. Verse 7, if you abide in me, and that probably will be the case. So which one is it? Utter confusion if you understand it as probable versus possible. Fourth class, if, and I wish it were true, if it's going to occur, which is very rare. In verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me. And this is an aorist act of subjunctive. It's a subjunctive because the if conditional clause demands that the following verb is subjunctive to go with the idea it might or might not be the case. So I've explained to you the necessity of abiding in me. Now the question is, will you? Will you? Now what this teaches us as believers is that we may be in Christ but fail to abide. It teaches us that there's a choice to be made. It teaches us we have an option. And it's going to teach us that there are consequences to what we choose, whether to abide in Christ or not. For if anyone does not abide in me, here's the consequences. He is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them, namely unfruitful branches, and throw them, namely unfruitful branches, into the fire. And they, unfruitful branches, are burned. Now I emphasize this because this is a metaphor. It's an analogy that oftentimes is misunderstood. This has become a favorite verse of some who deny the eternal security of the believer and say, see, if you fail to abide in Christ, you're going to go to hell. And they interpret the word fire to be hell. Well, frankly, this has nothing to do with hell. That's not even in the context. And it's only written to believers who have already been promised by our Lord in John 10, 28, 
that I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, for I and my Father are one. Furthermore, throughout the book of John, the believers granted eternal life the moment they're saved, not semi-annual or temporal, depending on their spiritual batting average. And furthermore, if fire meant hell, notice they gather them and throw them into the fire. Do people throw you into the fire? Well, of course not. You see, what he's doing here is he's simply following through on the illustration he's using of a branch in the vine. And so the consequences of failing to abide in Christ involve a number of things. Number one, a loss of fellowship with the Lord. He is cast forth as a branch. He's disconnected from that fellowship that is necessary and that dependence that is necessary to be fruitful. And in that disconnected state, whatever growth or fruit was there is no longer going to remain there because now he is withered. He had vitality. He had some growth. Perhaps he was on his way to fruitfulness or maybe was there, but now he's disconnected and now he is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned in the sense that the purpose of the branch was just the bare fruit cannot be fulfilled. And what do people do with unfruitful branches? From a vineyard, they just throw them in the fire. Why? Because they're of no practical value to anyone. And you see, if a believer doesn't abide in Christ because they approach the Christian life either mechanically or mystically or legalistically or maybe licentiously, the result will, not be, well, result will be a lack of fellowship and ultimately a lack of fruitfulness and a failure to the most basic principle of your life that God saved you by his grace and entered you into this eternal relationship with him, that you would glorify him and be fruitful for his honor and for his glory. And you see, dear believer, you have a choice in this matter. This has nothing to do with losing salvation. It has everything to do with losing fellowship and the ramifications of that in your life. And that explains at times the carnal Christian that explains at times why you know of people who were saved and walking with the Lord, and now they are no longer. The term that was used in the past is they were backslidden, and that indeed is an Old Testament term that especially was referring to the nation of Israel. But we know that believers can live in carnality, and should they remain in carnality, this is the kind of life they're going to live. Now, whom the Lord loves, he does chasten, and he will seek to get their attention. And remind them again of the importance of abiding in Christ. But this is the bad option. This is not what God wants in your life. Option number two, choice number two, with consequences number two, are far better. And again, it's introduced by a conditional clause with the word if in the third class condition. If, third class condition, you, again, abide in me, and if, and this is inserted or subsumed, my words abide in you, and the word if, again, means you might or you might not. Again, this teaches us that we have choices, that the Christian life is step by step. Without him, we can do nothing. We need him. And the option of abiding in him is always available to us. Again, failures yesterday, failures a moment ago. Don't guarantee failures right now. He's offering to us his fellowship. And by the way, I think, based upon the word of God, that God never breaks fellowship with us. We break fellowship with him. And he wants us to turn back to him, to admit when we've been wrong, and to yield and depend upon him afresh, and walk in the light as he's in the light so we can have fellowship one with another. 
Now, as we think of this, if my, you abide in me and if my words abide in you. So we see again, abiding is emphasized. But what's added now is, and my words abide in you. So as you're walking in yielded dependence upon the Lord, you're to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's what the Spirit of God is going to use to change your human viewpoint to divine. It's what he's going to use to feed your soul so that you can grow. It is going to be a light into your path, a lamp into your feet, a light into your path. It's going to give you direction and guidance. It's going to repeatedly show you your insufficiency and the beauty and the wonder and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And what will be the consequences? There are several. Consequence number one, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, there's a little textual variant here in which you will ask what you desire is translated in most other translations as an imperative, not an indicative. Here it's an indicative. You will ask, that's a fact, where it's an imperative in other translations in which it says, ask and you're going to get what you desire. Why? Because you're asking with God's word abiding in you. You're asking with a sense of what the will of the Lord is, what the word of God has to say. And as a result, you can be assured he's going to answer prayers like that. That's a divine promise. Consequence number two, by this my Father is glorified, and that's the ultimate vertical purpose. You see, the fruit isn't for you, and the fruit isn't, first of all, for others. The fruit really is to bring honor and glory to the Lord. And when God is glorified in your life, because you've taken him at his word, when he's glorified in your life because he's making you like Christ, when he's glorified in your life by the love that happens through the fruit of the Spirit, when he's glorified in your life as you fulfill his will and even share the gospel, you're fulfilling the purpose for which you've been saved. Consequence number three, you bear much fruit. And that's the specific personal purpose in the passage. And the means of fulfilling number two. You're bearing fruit. And again, remember, you're not producing it. You're bearing it. The fourth result is you will prove to be my disciples. And that's the horizontal byproduct that can occur. The word prove has that sense from the Greek. And even is translated as such, I believe, in the New American. You see, you prove to be his disciples, you prove to be his students, his learners, his followers, because he's taught us, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, and love is one of the fruit that is produced in our life. And indeed, he wants to produce much fruit. So you have two options, believers, and there is no third. There is no middle choice. It's one or the other. Either you're going to be abiding in Christ or not abiding in Christ. You're either going to be depending upon him or not depending on him. You're either going to be walking, having fellowship with the Lord, walking by faith, or you're not. And as a result, you're either going to be fruitful or you're not. The question is, which one will it be?